What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. Countdown to the new world order. President Bush calls it a big idea, and it's fast becoming the driving force and underlying cause of the biggest power shift in the history of the world. We've been told that the new world order is the primary reason the United States went to war in the Persian Gulf. And exactly what is this new world order? Whose big idea is it anyway? Is it just another political slogan? Even more important, how is it going to work for the people in this country and around the world politically and economically? The people want to know. The public needs to know. This is Larry Abraham. He's done more to uncover the plans and the true purpose of the New World Order than anyone. He revealed the secret code name, the New World Order, in 1971 when he learned about an elite group of powerful internationalists and their plans to reorganize the world. He co-authored the best-selling book, None Dare Call It Conspiracy, which has sold over five million copies, and he recently completed the hard-hitting sequel, Call It Conspiracy, which reveals the true purpose of the New World Order. He's also the editor of Insider Report, an internationally known investment newsletter, and GEO, a new financial newsletter that focuses exclusively on investment opportunities in the environmental movement. Larry will be talking with Wallace W. Wood, a veteran journalist and radio talk show host. Chip, as his friends call him, is also the president of Clarion House, a book publishing company in Atlanta, Georgia. This program was recorded November 14, 1990, two months before the outbreak of the war in the Persian Gulf. Larry, Tom Brokaw says there's a new buzzword in Washington, New World Order. Nobody would heard it until a few months ago when uh, President Bush, in addressing a joint session of Congress last September, said that he and Mikhail Gorbachev are building a new world order. It was a new phrase to new people with new meaning or no meaning, except to you. Twenty years ago, in None Dare Call It Conspiracy, you and Gary Allen wrote, and I'm going to quote it, the insider's code word for the world superstate is new world order. What did you know 20 years ago that Tom Brokaw only learned a few months ago? Well, I think that uh, what Gary and I did in our original book uh, 20 years ago was we examined uh, the uh, unfolding evidence of power that had been going on virtually since uh, before the turn of the century. And if you read the... Uh, the material, uh, the magazines, the books, the articles, uh, by the architects of the New World Order, it was easy to deduce 20 years ago that uh, that was the code word and that was uh, what was going to be used and, it, and had been used. If it was new to Brokaw, uh, it shouldn't have been. Well, you've been a student of history for as long as I've known you, and you referred a moment ago to the architects, the, the planners. You've referred in your writing to the wise men. Uh, I think the most common word used for this, this group uh, is insiders. Who are they, and can they really plan the world? Well, when you ask who are they, you, have to, uh, you almost have to turn the pages back. Uh, you have to go back and say, who were they and who are they now? Uh, and one of the things that, that is so compelling about any discussion of this type is how long uh, the planning on the part of the architects has been going on. Uh, Gary and I picked up the thread in 1885 with the establishment of the Round Table Group in Great Britain uh, under the uh, auspices and tutelage of uh, the Oxford Don John Ruskin uh, and a group who orbited around him, uh, primarily Cecil Rhodes of uh, Rhodesia, South African fame, uh, Lord Alfred Milner, uh, uh, Sir A. Bailey, Lord Lothian, and the others. But at the same time, in the United States, working with them 
And about the same time, even as it relates to continuity, uh, the Carnegie fortune uh, was used to set up the first of the major uh, foundations, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And the man who was directing uh, the expenditures of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace was Elihu Root, who was a, a major mover and shaker uh, in the councils of power, uh, both within in, uh, Washington, D.C. And, and, and New York. So that's where the thread of this has to be picked up. And I know it can be a little tedious when you start marching your way through the pages, but when you start seeing the power and influence that has been exerted over this long period of time, you'll see that there is a de definite continuity, and even the phraseology New World Order had its origins at that time. So all of the time that most Americans thought that the enemy of freedom was, say, world communism, or prior to that, Nazism and fascism. Going back long before that, even before World War I, there was a group, uh, Britain and the United States. Was it primarily Anglophile all along? Yeah, it was primarily Anglo-American. In fact, uh, this, was the, this was one of the major tenets of, uh, of the Roundtable group, that the Anglo-American connection were destined to, to govern and rule the world. Uh, and they played that down because Anglophobia in the United States was still very much alive at that time. Uh, I, even during the Roosevelt administration, one of the, one of the great raps against Roosevelt and, and his secretaries of state was that they were far too uh, uh, Anglophile. Oh, yes. And uh, so they played that down. But if you go back and read the original Rhodes Will, which served as a basis for funding an awful lot of this, uh, you will see that it spelled out very clearly that the Anglo-American nexus, primarily through the power of money and its influence in government, would serve as the basis for this new world order. Now these men, these early architects, could not have dreamed that they themselves would rule the world, that they would see their dream come true, did they? Well, uh, that's always a sticky question. Uh, as to whether or not somebody can be dev that devoted to a particular project, uh, fully aware that it may not come to fruition in their life. Um, I believe, as you study the, the lives of these men, uh, they felt that the vision that they carried forward was important enough that they were going to carve their place in history. Now, the insiders seem to draw their talent, their, their people, their progeny, from, from at least three gene pools, if, if you can use that phrase, uh, certainly the power of money, banking fortunes and business fortunes, certainly the power of government, the rulers of the state. But there's a third one, and you mentioned one uh, in John Ruskin, the academicians. Uh, most people wouldn't think of college professors as power-driven creatures. But well, some were. Yeah, well, indeed they are. And, and that's a very interesting relationship, uh, almost a symbiotic relationship, if you will. Uh, two independent species mutually dependent on one another for their existence. <laughs> uh, if you go back in history, you will find, uh, and this is worthy of a book, and I hope I have a chance to do it one of these years, uh, that there exists this relationship between the academic and the, and the powerful... Um, money power, if you will, uh, that takes on a connotation that isn't particularly desirable, but, but great wealth. Let me give you a couple examples in history. Uh, the Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli is basically a letter written from an academic who was a student of the accumulation and the exercise of power to a head of state who was also a very powerful person um, money-wise as to how to exercise and employ that power. That's what the prince is. Mm -hmm. um, jump forward a couple hundred years, and you'll find exactly the same sort of relationship the, between Voltaire and Frederick of Prussia. Uh, and then jump forward another 150 years, and you'll see that relationship between Ruskin and Lord Rothschild, Cecil Rhodes, A. Bailey, and the Roundtable Group. Jump forward uh, to current times, and you'll see that uh, the key position, the National Security Advisor, since that position was created in 1947, uh, the man who is most 
has the most access to the President of the United States on matters having to do with building the new world order or framing a foreign policy was always an academic. McGeorge Bundy in the Kennedy administration, uh, Henry Kissinger in the Nixon Ford administration, Zbigniew Brzezinski in the Carter administration, uh, and uh, General Scowcroft. General, no, the man is a doctorate in academician and a protege of Henry Kissinger's. So this relationship between academic and power centers, money and government, is uh, time honored in history and one that should not be a surprise to anybody. Well, yet not every college professor aspires to be, can be, or even knows about the people you call the insiders. What makes a Kissinger, a Harvard Don, or a Brzezinski uh, emerge from, from, from that backwater, if I can call it that, to becoming uh, as powerful as they are, a Secretary of State, a multi-millionaire wheeler dealer worldwide? Well, what, what, uh, what prompts that is a phrase out of the German, real politique, uh, where they, they drop the pretensions of uh, just uh, the pure academic pursuit, the ivory tower approach, and they start framing it up in a way that has specific dimension as it relates to power within political frameworks. As a journalist, and I don't think that it, it's possible for an honest journalist who at least keeps his eyes open, uh, to do anything but recognize this, sooner or later you come face to face with what Enoch Powell called a power that need not speak its name. Um, what uh, the, uh, the chairman of the Bank of England uh, dreamed a dream, Montague Norman, uh, very candidly, and he said, I dream of a time when the power of money will hold sway, uh, world hegemony as he called it. Um, so this was the, he was dreaming this dream how far back? How well, this is uh, right around the turn of the century, uh, in the 19 te teens and the 20s. Um, and he was right there at the creation of our central bank uh, in 1913 when the Federal Reserve was created. He was acting as a tutor uh, for, the, for the architects of our Federal Reserve system. And an interesting little tidbit is that uh, he and our first uh, Fed chairman, um, um, it's speculated that uh, they were lovers, uh, homosexual hmm. lovers, uh, Benjamin Strong. And um, they spent an awful lot of time together in some pretty exotic ports of call. Uh, be that as it may, um, when an academic really s begins to sort this out and starts to see how the real world works, then they are attracted to it almost like flies to light. Remember one of the problems that many academics suffer is uh, what they believe to be an underappreciation for their, for their work. Yes. There's almost a, a politics of envy at work here, uh, that uh, the great uh, lump and proletariat doesn't understand how smart we are, uh, nor does the uh, great bourgeois understand how smart we are. So this kind of drives them, I think, and, and that's where the power starts to seep into their personalities. And as a, a great journalist of the 20th century who saw all this and witnessed it, and then ultimately wrote about it and rejected it, Malcolm Muggeridge, uh, said that sooner or later, everybody must come to grips with uh, the acceptance of power or the acceptance of love in the Christian sense of the word. You can't have yeah, both. both. Yeah. Well, and there, this has long been recognized, uh, I think it was Henry Kissinger, who uh, said power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. That's a quote attributed to Dr. Kissinger. I think that says more about Dr. Kissinger than it does about <laughs> either power or aphrodisiacs. But there have always been, throughout history, there have always been would-be kings and would-be consort, consorts and persons who I'm sure felt they deserved to rule, whether they came from colleges or courts. But you're saying that these men and some women not only feel they should rule, but have been planning to rule, have coalesced into organizations that have planned now for generations for that rule. Uh, for a couple of moments, let's trace it organizationally, and then let's trace it uh, in terms of events. But uh, you said a lot of this began with the round table in the late 1800s. Yes. Um, the first uh, major organization, like I said, that sprung up a, a corollary to the round table group 
was the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace under the direction of Elihu Root, uh, former Secretary of State and Secretary of War and Senator from New York, but a, a very, very bright lawyer uh, who, who understood stood how the world worked and who had a vision of this world order, just as Ruskin did. And just as Ruskin was able to intoxicate Rhodes and Milner and Rothschild and the others in England, Root was able to intoxicate uh, people like uh, uh, Carnegie and Morgan. And that influence endured right up until uh, after World War I. Um, the basis for the establishment of a formal uh, United States organization to correspond to the Roundtable Group in England was developed at meetings at the Majestic Hotel in Paris uh, and set the stage for what followed in 1922 with the creation of the Council on Foreign Relations in America and then its sister organizations in throughout the British Commonwealth, what are called the Royal Institutes for International Affairs, in Britain commonly referred to as Chatham House. Um, and those organizations are the ones that many academics writing about this have referred to as uh, the invisible government, for example. Now, uh, that continuity uh, that has existed with the Council on Foreign Relations, interestingly enough, has never been more prominent than it is today as we speak uh, at the end of 1990, beginning of 1991. Um, and it's been almost a revolving door with CFR membership into and out of government. Um, there's never been a Federal Reserve Chairman, for example, who wasn't a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. With only one exception, James Burns, every Secretary of State since that period of time, right up until including this very day, is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Secretaries of the Treasury, now Secretaries of Defense, formerly Secretaries of War, have all been key people within the framework of the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, this creates a problem in the minds of other academics who aren't clued in. Um, the perennial sophomore types who love to run around bashing up on what they call conspiracy theory. But the truth of the matter is, is that if they were really smart, if they had really done their homework, they wouldn't bash up on conspiracy theory because the primary academics of the age understand that the rule of the elite is as they see it, as they see it, part of the natural order of things. And that's the way things should be. And that's what you have when you start talking about this in its, in its greatest context, is an elitism to the manner born. Uh, people who actually believe that because of their background and their education and their antecedents that they are the ones who are destined to bring about this new world order. And they really believe it. Now, for the past hundred years, they've talked about it. They've dreamed about it. They've planned for it. They've worked for it. They've told each other what they're doing. But it's only been in the last year that international headlines have announced it. That's correct. What's made the difference? Well, I think it's uh, uh, you have the right men in the right place. Um, I wrote a special report uh, right after the advent of the Bush administration uh, called Ambush, the struggle, the insider struggle for control of the Bush administration. And it pointed out at that time that now you had with the Bush administration um, the composite of the right men in the right place at the right time, uh, particularly within the United States government. Um, and with the advent of Mikhail Gorbachev in the Soviet Union, again, the right men in the right place at the right time. So that uh, on September 11th, uh, 90, uh, President Bush could go before a joint session of Congress and announce with great enthusiasm and great fanfare and flourish that now the new world order is a reality. And that what's going on in the Middle East is uh, part of what he called establishing the new world order. And he even referred to, uh, Chip, what you call this dream. He said, for uh, a hundred generations, men have dreamed about this. Well, a hundred generations, by my reckoning, that's 2,000 years. That kind of brings the new world order into some sort of potential conflict with something else that was going on for 2,000 years, and that is basically the rise of Christendom. That might be the subject of another discussion at some other time, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's the culmination of years of planning, uh, the right men in the right place at the right time, and, unfortunately, 
uh, a destruction of the will to resist on the part of the electorate, not only in this country, but in Great Britain and England and France and throughout the world, uh, to really recognize what is at stake here. Uh, you ask the average person out on the street, uh, have you heard anything about the New World Order? Well, yeah, vaguely they, they might recognize it. Do, do you know what it is? And mm -hmm. I suspect we would search long and hard uh, before we'd find somebody who could quickly articulate uh, at least the no. rudiments of it. I think part of the problem is they don't feel yet personally affected. True. And if you could somehow show them that the job they hold will depend on... Well, I hope that's order. something we can accomplish in the course of that, this discussion, yeah. is to show them that this isn't something that is off uh, and being discussed in the greater uh, councils of the hierarchy that doesn't affect them, it does affect them, and we, want, we will certainly want to get into that. But I think that this background is very important because if you, if you study the exercise of power, and I can't think of anything, looking at it through the eyes of a, of a perpetual student of history, uh, that is more, uh, more exciting to examine, and that is the use and the abuse of power. Because if you want to study the history of mankind, basically that's what it is from the time, you know, Cain slew Abel. Uh, right up until this very moment, uh, violence has been used as a, as a method, a methodology, if you will, for bringing about one man's control over another or one man's control over masses. In his uh, recent uh, book, recently published book, Power Shift, Alvin Toffler, the futurist, says uh, uh, quite accurately that you can, can control people basically with three mechanisms, violence, mm -hmm. money, or knowledge. Now, when you get into knowledge, there's a great big spin-off there. You're talking about everything from books and pamphlets uh, of uh, Thomas Paine uh, type influence during the revolutionary period in the United States, right down to and including uh, the nightly news with Peter Jennings, Tom Brokaw et al. So uh, this exercise of power basically comes through three conduits, and that's where the New World Order is going to play itself out. And I think that's, these are the things we have to examine if people are going to understand how it affects them. Now, you said they were going public with it, as it were, are ready to tell the world they're ready to build it because they had the right men in the right place at the right time, but not everywhere. Uh, some of the men, by the way, were women, and there was one who stood in their path, Margaret Thatcher of Britain. And I remember you writing at least a year or two earlier saying, they have decided she must go. Why was she targeted, and what happened? Well, Maggie was uh, targeted because she understood very clearly that if you surrender monetary sovereignty to some extra national organization, uh, you will soon surrender political sovereignty as well. She said so many times. She said she did not want England to lose its sovereignty by entering into a European currency, a European central bank. So uh, by May of 88, her voice in opposition uh, to the New World Order game plan for the economic structuring of Europe had become a formidable voice. And so uh, I said in Insider Report that uh, we could now expect to see the attacks on Margaret Thatcher heat up, and particularly within the framework of her own conservative party. Uh, she, I don't think Labor could have ever gotten her out. Uh, but uh, the conservative attacks by uh, uh, Michael ha Hazeltine, uh, the disaffection of uh, uh, Sir Geoffrey Howe, and others uh, forced Mrs. Thatcher into a position where she could no longer seek her party's leadership. Now, regardless of, uh, of her successor, that person knows that the most important thing he has to buy in on is British entry into the European community, uh, the European Parliament, and the surrender of monetary and ultimate political sovereignty. Is there now left on the world political scene or the world monetary scene a significant opponent? No. What's going to stop the New World Order from coming about? Frankly, I, I don't think that if you take a look at it in the short run, uh, there's anything that's going to stop it unless the American people uh, decide that this issue is so important 
that they make it a cornerstone in every congressional campaign in the uh, subsequent uh, elections. Um, that was the, that was the uh, suggestion that Gary and I offered 20 years ago. We said, forget all this nonsense about chasing after the presidential illusion because you're going to get uh, New World Order candidate A and New World Order candidate B on both of the two major parties. The issue, if it's going to be brought into the public arena, will have to be done through the Congress. Uh, and that's the only way it will be stopped, is if the Congress of the United States and every congressman seeking re-election has to take a stand. Are you for or against the New World Order game plan as it affects the United States? Now, this, of course, <laughs> it puts the onus right back on us. Some wag once said years ago that every people get exactly the government they deserve. I would hope that we deserve more than what I see coming down the pipe as it relates to the New World Order, but that will depend on whether it can be made into a popular political issue. Well, we've seen a hundred-year dream now ready to come to fruition. They've plotted, they've planned, they've promised, and now they say they're ready to complete the circle, close the neck. Uh, next, let's talk about exactly what that will mean. How will my world, your world, our children's world, change as they become part of a new world order? After a brief pause, Larry Abraham and Chip Wood continued their discussion of how things will change in the future and who the architects of that change will be. They began the second part of their discussion talking about some of the institutions and organizations leading the way to a new world order. These uh, institutions that are actually framing what, we, what is happening today are by and large uh, totally unknown to the, uh, to the average American person, even unknown in many instances to uh, people who are specialists in a particular discipline. Economics is a good example. Give me an example now of what you mean. Well, let me, let me just cite one example, Chip, that I think uh, really makes, makes the point. Um, a very good friend and a very uh, informed economist uh, recently wrote a book uh, talking about economic failures and uh, the problems with the melding of the state and economic policy. And uh, we see a great deal of uh, discussion going on today about the failure of socialism throughout uh, the Eastern Bloc. But even this doctor of economics was unaware of uh, an organization uh, recently founded in 1983 called the Institute for International Economics. Uh, here in their first issue, volume one, number one, uh, of uh, their new publication, which will be published bi-monthly, International Economic Insights. Right on the front cover, uh, they have a new world order in the 1990s. And then uh, here's a, a picture of the United States. Uh, it's a surrealistic drawing, as you can see, almost chessboard type, which has some interesting ramifications to it as well. Is the United States holding sway in the Western Hemisphere, uh, crown head, obviously representing uh, the old crown heads of Europe, Austro-Hungarian, Habsburg sort of thing, holding sway in uh, Europe, uh, Africa. And then um, an old samurai uh, figure uh, holding sway in the Far East. United States, West Germany, and Japan, um, a new world order in the 1990s. Now this organization if you think it's just made up of a, of a few ivory tower thinkers, think again. I mean, uh, it was founded by the same people who founded the Trilateral Commission in 1973. Ten years later, they formed the Institute for International Economics. And uh, Fred Bergston, the director of it, uh, who was Henry Kissinger's deputy for monetary affairs in the National Security Council while Kissinger held both posts, both as national security uh, uh, director and Secretary of State, says, I hope you're already aware of the Institute as the world's premier think tank on international economic issues. Uh, we have established a, go a global reputation for excellence in analysis, effectiveness in presenting ideas, and no less a person on the whole subject of monetary authority than former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker, also uh, an honorary director of the organization, says, uh, the Institute for International Economics has no equal in setting out relevant issues of economic policy in a comprehensive way. The man who heads up uh, their research department, Richard N. Cooper, is a man whom I've written about at great length, as you know, uh, Yale, Harvard. And Cooper is the one who talked about that the world has to be shaped 
into these new economic monetary authorities and that it would, in Cooper's words, have to be run by an inner club, his words, not mine, yeah. that would accept this higher responsibility. Yes. And, uh, and ergo, uh, what this means, what this surrealistic cover means, is that the major currencies of the world in the new world order structure, next phase, is the US dollar, the German Deutschmark, and the Japanese yen. And then out of that uh, will come uh, not just central banks for nations, but central banks for regions. And this goes back again to what Mrs. Thatcher saw as, as quite frightening and, and why she opposed it, where you will have a central bank and a common currency for all of Europe. You will have a central bank and a common currency for all of the Western Hemisphere. You will have a central bank and a common currency for all of East Asia. Uh, and it will initially start off with the dollar, the Deutschmark, and the yen being fixed. The currency exchange rates will no longer float. They will be fixed to each other. Then these other national currencies will float against them, but ultimately those currencies will be surrendered and new regional money issued. Now, if, if all of this is going to bring a time of peace and stability and prosperity worldwide, if that's what these dreamers dream and these planners plan, what's so bad about it? Well, that's the question I get asked quite often. Um, there, if, if uh, we were just talking about the lion laying down with the lamb and the swords being beaten into plowshares, certainly nobody could be opposed to that. In fact, you would embrace okay. it and you'd run out to, to grab it. Well, what's the price we have to pay for but all But the price this? we have to pay was outlined very succinctly and I think accurately in a, a book written in the late 60s by a very informed academician, Dr. Carol Quigley, who was then uh, a professor uh, at the Foreign Service Institute at Georgetown University. In his book, Tragedy and Hope, where Quigley talked about the rule of, the, the, of this emerging elite and the Anglo-American establishment, as he called it, uh, Quigley said that as far as the average citizen is concerned, you, me, we'll be numbered from birth, we will be tracked throughout our life with that number, right up through to and including our, uh, our death and ultimate death benefits. Now, if a person doesn't mind living in almost a, a rabbit hutch environment, uh, then they will probably find the New World Order uh, to their liking. But there won't be room for voices of opposition. We are now facing, in my opinion, Chip, the ages-old argument, from whence does man's sovereignty emanate? Is it a creation of the state, or is it something inherent, a God-given right? And if it is a God-given right, as I believe and as you believe, and most people, I think, generally take for granted, then the state has to get out of the way in many instances. But within the framework of the new world order, the state will not get out of the way. The state will be the dominant entity, but not just as a state instrument. It's a welding together, if you will, of big business, big government, and big labor institutions. Um, People are inherently starting to get a little suspicious of big anything, big media, big banking, big government, and well, they should, because this network is going to start making us, our, our options in our personal life, very, very yeah. narrow. That's what concerns me. Now, let's talk about some of the tools they're using to achieve this, because you've written many times on their use of contrived crises. Yes. And Lord knows that today, as we've seen the end of the first year of the 1990s, the, the beginning of this incredible decade, uh, if somebody likes a world of excitement, we've got it. Uh, the ancient Chinese, I'm told, had a curse and meant it to be a curse. May you live in interesting times. Well, these are certainly interesting times. Um, as we see the world in snapshot around us today at the end of 1990 and the beginning of 1991, we see some things that seemed almost Im impossible to, uh, to grasp or to even anticipate. Um, and going back to the points that Toffler makes in Power Shift, where he says that people are changed, their lives are changed in three ways, uh, knowledge, money, and violence, 
uh, let's talk about violence and who controls the gun. He made he went even went further to quote uh, three make use three quotes on the frontispiece of Part One, Chapter One in his book. Uh, Mao Zedong, all power comes out of the barrel of a gun. Uh, money talks, and knowledge itself is power. Francis Bacon. Now, when you start talking about where is that uh, violence control mechanism, the re uh, emergence of the United Nations and it as a peacekeeping force in the world. Um, you see, as the Middle East crisis has developed and is unfolding, always the, the more predominant cry and even the acquisition of, uh, uh, or the, excuse me, the acquiescence on the part of the administration is to have the UN play a greater role. Uh, you even hear a so-called conservative spokesman talking about the UN is now going to fulfill its original promise. Well, what is that original promise? Surrender of sovereignty. The architects of the United Nations did not mean the, United States, the UN to be just a, uh, a debating society that became an embarrassment to itself, as it did over a long period of time. They meant it to be a power structure that would use the full force and effect of guns, guns, to bring about an adherence to the New World Order. And that's why the Middle East crisis is more important than just oil. A lot of people think that this fight is over oil. Uh, or some such thing as that. Well, that's a, that's a spin-off ancillary benefit if you happen to be invested in the oil business or the natural gas or the energy business. But the real message being sent here is that the United Nations Authority with the United States paraphernalia of war will impose the new world order. And that's what President Bush said. That's what uh, General Secretary and President Gorbachev said. That's what uh, Francois Mitterrand said. That's what Helmut Kohl said. That's what every leader who's pushing this has said, that this is a way to use the United Nations as the ultimate peacekeeper. I read a piece in the Los Angeles Times here a, a month or so ago that said that the UN and the US would act in unison to monitor elections around the world. Well, what does that mean? I mean, the, the two you, the, you are going to act as super cops to make sure that no government is elected anywhere that might break step with the new world order. Um, Mr. Saddam Hussein is learning the lessons very, very well that he breaks step with the new world order. Even old allies uh, say, Saddam who? Yeah. You know, they're looking the other way. So uh, the UN is now being brought to the forefront again, as it was originally intended to be, to be the police authority. Now there's another element, and that is the role of the world court uh, and how our constitution is going to give way to that. And, and that, uh, I think, is something that should give every American pause for concern. You know, I can remember 20 plus years ago talking about the role of the United Nations or the role that some would like it to have, uh, distributing copies of a State Department pamphlet on disarmament calling for a, an actual peacekeeping force, meaning an army, uh, of the United Nations. Isn't that what we're seeing built today? Yes, in indeed it is. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a very popular, uh, I don't know, popular in the, in the normal sense, but uh, popular in the sense that it's certainly being uh, aired a lot, a uh, documentary out there called uh, The UN Peacekeepers. Uh, extolling the virtues of the blue helmets. In fact, uh, the actual title of, the, uh, of the, our presentation is The Blue Helmets, uh, talking about the, the fact that the, uh, the blue helmets or the UN peacekeeping force should be used more often to settle not only international disputes, but internal disputes as well. And the narrator of Blue Helmets, uh, no less an authority on, provo on provoking disputes than uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, uh, says that at the time will come when there will be no standing armies anywhere in the world. That the only standing army will be the UN peacekeepers, the Blue Helmets. Now, um, this, is a, this brings the role of the UN into direct confrontation with the Constitution of the United States. And as you said 20 years ago, some of us were concerned and, uh, and talking about the, the potential danger of general and complete disarmament uh, State Department document 7277, which called for general and complete disarmament to the United Nations Authority. 
Uh, that's coming about as we speak. Um, people are accepting it today. Um, at a uh, recently concluded Congress in Paris, uh, where the heads of the 35 member nations of the Council for Security and Cooperation in Europe met, um, almost uh, missing the headline was the fact that the most massive disarmament took place there, uh, and the CSCE, Council for Security and Cooperation in Europe, is there under the auspices of the United Nations. And I think that anybody who rushes out to embrace the new world order ought to say, what happens to our individual constitutional protections in a society like ours vis-a-vis -a, -vis a totally secular, humanist approach to the affairs of man as it is, as it is uh, laid out in the United Nations declarations of human rights and genocide and all the rest. Militarily now, the new world order will be enforced with guns, and the guns will be held by the Blue Helmets. By the Blue Helmets. Uh, once the Middle East crisis has run its initial phase, and uh, Saddam Hussein and uh, Iraq have been smashed, uh, and part of what is re called reshaping the Middle East, uh, once that has happened, um, then there will be on the ground a permanent UN peacekeeping authority. Now, anybody who looks at that uh, with any penetration will have to start asking themselves, then what does this mean as it relates to, say for example, the debate going on between Palestinian and Israeli on the West Bank. Uh, and if you recall, midst all of this discussion of reshaping the Middle East, there's talk uh, of linkage. What does linkage mean in this instance? Well, specifically that Saddam Hussein says, well, I'll talk about pulling out of Kuwait if, if you'll talk about the PLO and its, uh, and its claim to uh, the West Bank uh, in, in Israel. Um, and an awful lot of the liberal American Jewish community who has been uh, avidly uh, pro-Zionist as it relates to their stance on Israel are going to have to choose. They're going to have to say, well, I'm pro-UN or I'm, uh, I'm pro-the independence of Israel because the leadership in Israel, um, Shamir, uh, Sharon, um, Aaron's, all of them know that once that camel's nose goes under the tent and those blue helmets are sitting there inside Israel, uh, their national sovereignty is really at risk. From an entirely different point of view, the Israelis are looking at this with as much uh, skepticism as Mrs. Thatcher did over on the economic side of the ledger, because Mrs. Thatcher knew, uh, as anybody who ever studied the, the expansion of the Roman Empire originally, or even the British Empire originally, once monetary authority is surrendered, political authority shortly thereafter follows. The Israelis, on the other hand, while not so concerned about the monetary aspects of the New World Order, they're looking at it from the standpoint of the violence aspects, or who's got the guns. It, already you see the calls going out. Uh, Bishop Tutu, for example, is calling for the Blue Helmets to come in as the uh, ultimate authority in settling uh, the, the internal disruptions going on, not just black and white in South Africa, but black to black. Right. Uh, as some of us wrote years ago, that if uh, there was one man, one vote in South Africa tomorrow and a black leader was elected the day after tomorrow, 14 uh, tribes would be at war with one another. But Tutu saying, bring the blue helmets in. Let them be the ultimate police peacekeeping authority because none of us, referring to his, his colleagues uh, of the socialist left, uh, trust the government uh, to bring about that peacekeeping authority. Uh, the same plans, I might add, are being advanced, not only for Israel, as we talked earlier, but for Northern Ireland. Uh, the same plans will ultimately be advanced and are being advanced in preparation to what many of the revolutionaries in this country, the Louis Farrakhans, the Stokely Carmichaels, and, and their type, say will come in the United States, where you will have to have blue helmets occupying the United States, not blue helmets with the kid from Iowa or the kid from Gig Harbor, Washington, or, or uh, Dunwoody, Georgia, uh, but somebody who doesn't even speak the language drawn from as far away as possible so that they, uh, they don't have any prejudices, as it were. And, uh, uh, and you go listen to a Louis Farrakhan uh, speak, uh, or listen to a Stokely Carmichael speak, 
Um, or a Bishop Tutu. Or a Bishop Tutu. Yeah. You will see them all repeating the same thing. Uh, that the time is coming where racism is so inherent in America that it cannot be resolved with traditional American solutions. So, uh, and uh, the Communist Party, which everybody thinks is passe at this point in time, um, the current uh, issue of political affairs, their top monthly, their theoretical monthly, uh, the lead article is written by uh, the General Secretary of the Communist Party, uh, Gus Hall, yes, Gus Hall is still alive and well, and he talks about the dialectics of eliminating racism. Well, anybody who understands Hegel uh, and how it is used in the communist jargon understands that using, linking up dialectics and the elimination of racism means that the opposite is exactly what the strategy will be. Dialectically, you don't eliminate race, racial hatred. Dialectically, you enhance yeah. racial hatred. And I don't think anybody today, looking around them in any portion of the United States, certainly in our major cities, can honestly say to themselves that racial relations are better today than they were 25 years ago. They are not. Yeah. Racial hatreds and racial suspicions are being brought up to the point where at some point downstream, and I'm not talking about tomorrow or even five years from now, but at some point in time, you will have uh, crypto uh, communist slash socialist slash wise men types saying let the blue helmets come and resolve the problems in Newark or Detroit or uh, Los Angeles. Larry, that's a pretty frightening picture. I mean, a UN surgical quick strike in the Middle East, uh, UN forces ready to make America behave, UN forces in South Africa to solve, quote, solve their problems. Uh, are there people today planning to make this happen? Oh, yes, indeed. In fact, um, early on I referred to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, um, and it as a, a predecessor to many of the uh, organizations like the Council on Foreign Relations. Back in the early 60s, uh, a lengthy study was done by the Carnegie Endowment as to how to employ the United Nations uh, as the instrument for bringing about a desired, <laughs> according to their words, a desired condition in South Africa. So there's a 30-year-old plan uh, paid for by one of the, uh, the major architectural firms of the New World Order, as it were. So yes, these sorts of things are being uh, uh, doped out, scoped out, written about, uh, hypothesized, and projected. Uh, for example, in the Middle East, um, I cited in a recent issue of Insider Report, um, right after the whole thing broke out in August of 90, that uh, an article, a seminal article, appeared in Foreign Affairs, the, the quarterly of the, of the Council on Foreign Relations, um, written by Dr. Barry Rubin, called Reshaping the Middle East, where he specifically focused on Iraq as the basis for uh, this sort of action, this sort of military action, under the auspices of a UN coalition uh, to reshape the Middle East. So yes, these things are being discussed very seriously and have been over a long, long period of time. Now you've, you've been speaking and lecturing and writing about this subject and similar ones for the better part of, of two decades. You've had one best-selling book that sold several million copies, are working on two others right now. Uh, with all of this effort to convince your fellow man that these things are happening because people plan them and they can be stopped, do you, do you find it easier to get people to believe it, to believe that these things are the result of deliberate plan and deliberate policy? Yes, I do. Um, because when uh, my late partner Gary Allen and I f first wrote uh, our, our book, None Dare Call It Conspiracy, in 1971, um, as we used to laugh at the time, we said we could have taken all the people who viewed the world the way we were seeing it and held our convention in a large phone booth. Uh, today, uh, that is uh, accepted orthodoxy in a lot of circles. Um, and a lot of people who originally thought we had pushed the, uh, the, uh, the barriers of responsible reporting and journalism uh, to the extreme are now seeing that uh, that much of what we wrote about then is certainly um, a way of life today. So yes, I think that uh, there's a, a greater acceptance for uh, f for discussion of this type. 
the problem, Chip, is that people are feeling very powerless in all this. Um, after every election, uh, before an election or after an election, all sorts of pundits write all sorts of articles about why voter participation in the polls keeps dropping. Well, voter participation in the polls keep dropping because people don't think that they count, that their vote doesn't count, that they feel powerless in the face of this. And they may not know all of the ramifications. They may not read foreign affairs from cover to cover or uh, international economic insights uh, or the national interest or any of the other prominent quarterlies or journals. Uh, but there is such a thing as a street smart, there is such a thing as gut intuition, and it is this sense of powerlessness that most people have that I think expresses itself not so much in acts of commission, but acts of omission, i.e. don't show up at the right. polls. So to answer your question, it's a long way around to get there, but yes, there is a, an innate intelligence that sees this, and I'm happy to say even among academicians, who uh, poo-pooed us as a conspiratorial theorist. The conspiracy theory of history, or the devil theory of history, was hooted at as uh, uh, anti-intellectual, uh, and uh, certainly not befitting uh, some don at uh, Oxford or uh, professor adv of advanced studies at Johns Hopkins. Well, that's no longer the atmosphere. Um, the atmosphere has changed only per perennial sophomores teaching undergraduates politics or political science 101 still want to poo-poo uh, that as the devil theory of history. Uh, that is now becoming part of the discussion. Thank God, yeah. at long last, but not enough yet, not enough yet. Interestingly enough, while they've poo-pooed the conspiracy theory of history for you and me and others like us to, to disregard, uh, those in the know in Academy have always admitted to each other. Ah, oh, indeed. Oh, and have yeah. written to each other. You've, you've read a lot of the books that most Americans have never heard of. Give us some examples of this. Well, I cited uh, Dr. Quigley's book earlier, uh, uh, Tragedy and Hope, um, and uh, Dr. Philip Birch at Princeton's three-volume work, uh, Elites in American uh, History, or Elites in American Politics, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, a name known most, uh, to most people, has written about it, uh, always uh, kind of uh, written in language that, uh, well, you know and I know, and the people who don't know it doesn't make any difference. And in his book, New Industrial State and the Affluent Society, uh, George, uh, Professor uh, Selwyn Miller uh, at uh, George Washington University um, had some very, very eye-opening quotes that, uh, and I'll par paraphrase him, uh, that uh, American politics has always been run by a secret uh, group of elitists, but it's just one of yeah. those things you don't talk about in polite company, and that's what uh, Professor Miller said. And, uh, and others, uh, uh, Professor Steele, for example, in his biography of Walter Lippmann and the American Century, talked about it at great length. Uh, probably uh, the most important book uh, since Quigley's book in the 60s was a book uh, written uh, three years ago by Walter Isaacson and Evan Thomas, two, then two senior editors of Time magazine, uh, called The Wise Men, Six Friends in the World They Made. Now, who were the wise men? The wise men were John J. McCloy, uh, George Kennan, uh, Dean Acheson, uh, Robert Lovett, uh, Chip Bolin. Uh, these were the men who were shaping the world. And the wise men, interestingly enough, is a phrase that is used by insiders to denote the leadership of the insiders. Um, lengthy book talking very candidly about this. Uh, academicians from uh, Holland and England are writing about it now, too. Uh, elites in the building of the American uh, Atlantic Alliance. So there is the literature there for anybody who wants to examine it. The question is no longer even debated in informed circles. It's only debated uh, in uninformed circles or people who haven't bothered to check the evidence. The New World Order is not just happening. No, it the is. New World Order isn't just happening and uh, it isn't a new buzzword as, as you <laughs> Mr. Brokaw said. Mr. Said, Brokaw yeah. said uh, uh, when we first started discussing this, it's been around and it will continue to. Now, the problem, of course, is to build worldwide acceptance for it because it still needs political uh, approbation, particularly in the United States. 
How are they going to get that? How are they going to get people in the United States, in Europe, uh, anywhere around the world to accept the end of their political sovereignty? Well, they're going to hold it out as a promise and a solution to, uh, to other problems. Let's examine Europe. Uh, there is a very, very interesting one from one standpoint, and then we'll uh, examine Japan and, and the Orient as another one and then bring it home. In, in Europe today, uh, everybody looks upon the events of 1989 with great promise and great hope. The Berlin Wall crashing down and and uh, the exercises of freedom being exhibited throughout the uh, former Eastern Bloc nations. Uh, but what is not understood is that starting with the Helsinki uh, Agreement back in 1975 and the creation of the Council on Security and Cooperation in Europe, all of that would ultimately funnel the political power into what is being called the European Parliament. Um, interestingly enough, at the CSCE meeting in Paris, uh, in uh, in uh, late October, uh, early November of, uh, 18, uh, of 1990, uh, and the summit conference held in Houston between the major heads of state, uh, the seven G7 nations, one person sat there as an equal. Jacques Delors, the president of the European Council, yeah. was set, sitting there as an equal. I remember writing about it in, in Insider Report, a, sh a picture showing the the G7 leaders walking off to lunch. But there weren't seven, there were eight. And Jacques Delors, the president of the European Parliament, was right there as an equal. So what is going to be planned there is a, uh, a one monetary system, a central bank, as we talked about earlier. But then all these new arising so-called independent nations in Eastern Europe, um, Poland and Hungary and and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia and Latvia and Lithuania, Romania, Albania, Azerbaijan, the breakup of the 15 Soviet republics, they will all elect their representatives to the European Parliament. Now what does that mean? What does that portend? It portends a economic system that would make Mussolini and Hitler green with envy because it will bring the corporate state in as the major economic force in the affairs of man. Uh, the cartel uh, that exists, or the building and the restructuring of the cartels that exist. You can't pick up the Wall Street Journal or the business section of any major newspaper in this country on any given day without seeing another deal is being cut by some multinational corporation and the government of Poland or the government of Hungary or the government of, of uh, Russia. Uh, and. Um, you will recall, Chip, uh, years ago, in Insider Report, I used a, a speech from the movie Network, where the chairman of this major multinational corporation was explaining to the poor, demented newsman who had stuck his head out the window and said, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore, and he had everybody all excited. The chairman of the major multinational was explaining to him how the world really worked. He said at that time, there is no Russia, there is no America, there is no Japan, there are no communists. What you have is business. And that this makes for one international whole that will uh, right all wrongs and caress all feelings and massage all ills. And uh, after that speech, and I encourage anybody who's listening to us uh, to go out and re-rent the movie Network, and if for no other reason than to listen to that speech written by screenwriter Patty Chayefsky, who certainly understood how the world worked when he put those, uh, that into the, the, uh, the, the diatribe of uh, the corporate chairman, um, the poor, demented newsman played uh, brilliantly uh, by uh, the late Peter Finch looked up and he said, I think I have seen the face of God. And uh, the multinational chairman said, you may have. And you see, that's the point. You're going to have these huge cartels with the restructured monetary system as the basis for the economic environment. I have our very capable researcher, Franklin Saunders, working now to show the cartel arrangements that are going on between West, uh, formerly West Germany, now Germany, Japan, the United States, to show that these cartels don't operate just in a national sense, they operate in a trilateral sense. And when the insiders take a look at what sort of society do they want, uh, and what does it mean for us, they look at Japan 
with wanting mm -hmm. eyes and say, all of the Japanese consider themselves good corporate citizens. And anybody who falls outside of the scope of that sort of lifestyle is kind of looked on uh, askance as, well, uh, what's wrong with, uh, with him? Um, the corporation becomes the entity. The corporation mm -hmm. becomes the basis for loyalty. But the corporation gets its existence, as all monopolies and all cartels do, from the power of the state enforced by the power of the gun. I can remember in 1973 when uh, David Rockefeller and Zbigniew Brzezinski created the Trilateral Commission. Yes. Uh, one of the reasons we noticed it, first of all, we followed what David Rockefeller did, uh, but when he later tapped an obscure governor, and not very good one, of Georgia for uh, a man nobody thought was destined uh, for political greatness uh, to become a member and a, and a protege. Uh, but even then, I don't think we understood what the trilateral concept meant within the New World Order. I certainly didn't then. No, well, years at ago. that time it was it was hard to uh, it was hard to pull out of that uh, the various strictures that have now become institutionalized, as is evidenced by the yeah. cover of this magazine, uh, because they were still being framed up, still being formulated. But I should point out one of the least known chapters of contemporary world history is what happened to set the stage for this right at the end of World War II. Anybody who knows anything about World War II knows that there existed in Nazi Germany and in Imperial Japan uh, the cartel system, the fascist system, if you will, and economically defined fascism is government control over the means of production, distribution of goods, and allocation of services, as opposed to socialism, which is government ownership. Well, these cartels uh, had long-standing and very uh, unchallenged economic clout. Mm -hmm. uh, such cartels as the IG Farben industry, the great chemical trust that existed in Germany, um, and, and I might add the IG signed deals with Imperial Chemical in the UK and, and Standard Oil in, in the United States, and those, that cartel arrangement operated throughout the war. That was all brought out by uh, two men who set out to, to uh, try and write some of the abuses there uh, in a book called All Honorable Men by James Stuart Martin, who was a young lawyer in the, anti, uh, the alien property custodian at the close of World War II. Um, in Japan, you had what had existed for uh, a couple of hundred years, the Zaibatsu. Uh, the Zaibatsu is basically a cartel system. And the major cartels going into World War II were Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Sumutomo. Um, and at the end of the war, what happened under the, one of the wise men, John McCloy, who ended up as High Commissioner of West Germany, and the man who uh, died uh, just a few years ago and who was acknowledged by all as the chairman of the establishment, under McCloy, as High Commissioner of West Germany and his counterpart, uh, uh, former Congressman Draper, they left the cartel structures in place. Imagine it as a pyramid, if you will. They left the, the vast majority of that pyramid in place. They lobbed off the top, or the old family ownership, replaced that ownership control with stock ownership into banks, like the Dresdner Bank and the Deutsche Bank, or the Bank of uh, Tokyo, uh, or uh, Nippon Bank, uh, or Sumitomo Bank but then transferred the ownership of those cartels via stock transfers right back here. So if we're people wondered, who did we fight the war for when we look uh, back 40 years and say, OK, now our great friends are Germany and Japan. Well, we fought it for the New World Order architects here who were in a position to redesign the spoils of war. Mm -hmm. Did you end up with any shares in no. Sumitomo or Mitsubishi or Mitsui? I didn't. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, very few own stock in uh, Krupp, uh, Tyson, Damler, Benz. But that ownership and that cartel arrangement exists to, to this day. And that's why when the Trilateral Commission was formed up by David Rockefeller, uh, with his academic right at his side, uh, Harvard professor Zbigniew Brzezinski, the first people who were invited to be members of the Trilateral Commission were the corporate directors and managers of these cartels. Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, Krupp, 
Daimler Benz, Tyson, Phillips, and on and on it goes. And now, when the New World Order economically takes a look at what do they think is the best of all possible worlds, they look to Japan as the model because there the company is second only to the family in importance. Uh, you are born and raised and yeah. work and die under the, the auspices of your company. And there will be no conflict between these giant corporations and the New World Order, No, obviously. Well, there's a certain amount of competition goes on, yes, uh, but it's spirited competition uh, for the good of the order, as yeah. it were, uh, and all sorts of deals being done. Um, we read about Daimler Benz and uh, Mitsubishi getting together, and uh, Phillips and Siemens getting together. And now, uh, I read in the Wall Street Journal here just a couple of weeks ago that the old IG Farben had been laying there dormant since uh, all of the disclosures came about uh, of the cartel arrangement that existed, and throughout the war it's being re resurrected. So that's how the economic order will work uh, as it relates to the company store approach. And one of the things that has concerned me in the United States, Chip, and it's got to concern anybody who's looking out uh, in, in a macroeconomic sense, is that new capital formation, the small business is being discouraged. It's being discouraged by tax law. It's being discouraged by uh, economic environment. Uh, a whole lot of things are stopping entrepreneurial activity, which is at the backbone of America's strength. Uh, I see all sorts of entrepreneurial activity that is certainly deserving of capital formation, and, uh, but it's going begging today. And it's, it's what I called years ago an imploding society. The power keeps working itself more and more and more to a central authority that is all part of this new world order structure. Well, we have our own corporate Marxists playing this game, don't we? Yes, we do. Um, one of the things, in fact, years ago when I was just a puppy, that, uh, that was a contradiction I had a difficult time um, working around is every time I looked around and saw who was pushing socialism, or that is a greater role on the part of the part of the state, I'd look around and I'd see the super rich, like the Rockefellers and the Kennedys and uh, the uh, Howard Metzen bombs and people of that sort. And I thought, well, if socialism is, as I've been generally led to believe, uh, a great big economic pie where you count heads and everybody gets their equal share of the pie, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that Mr. Rockefeller was going to be a loser in that deal. So one of two things had to be the case. Either they knew something I didn't know, or uh, there was a, a, a level of stupidity there that defied uh, imagination. And then every time I kept thinking about, well, they're stupid, uh, I kept reminding the sage advice of my father, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? Uh, so I figured that there had to be more than just stupidity here. But then once you break the code and you see that the cartel and the state are not enemies, the cartel and the state are a symbiotic necessity and uh, are mutually dependent on one another, then all of the, uh, the cartel arrangements, the dynasties, the Rockefellers, the Kennedys, the Krupps, and all the rest, then it makes sense. Because as long as the state can guarantee that protection, uh, no monopoly can live without it. Now in this, in this brave new world they're building, what is the role of the individualist going to be? Well, the individualist is not going to like living in this world. No. And that's why I oppose it. I certainly see myself as an individualist. Um, we're, we're finding our privacy being invaded in every way today. Uh, finding privacy in one's financial life is almost impossible anymore. Um, even in one's personal life. Uh, the, the ability to co travel and, and move about with ease, these strictures will, will, uh, will become more and more evident. The question is often raised, well, why is this so bad? Uh, I mean, doesn't it make for peace? Doesn't it make for harmony? Um, well, if we were talking about individuals getting together across boundaries and over oceans, I'm all for that. But if people think just because of big government or the welding of political interest makes for the lion laying down with the lamb, they've forgotten their history. The most violent war ever fought where Americans participated was the Civil War. 
uh, and the wars that go on today in and of the streets of Northern Ireland or in the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, here you have individual political entities uh, or in the streets of Johannesburg or Pretoria. Just big government is no solution to goodwill. In fact, all history would seem to indicate exactly the opposite. Larry, if there's one thing that all of these threads have in common, from South Africa to the European community uh, to the Parliament of Man, uh, it's control of people's lives. At least that's what I'm getting out of this. But in a new way, not like a Hitler or a Genghis Khan, today the New World Order, with the exception of a Saddam Hussein, the New World Order is going to be built voluntarily. They want us not only to acquiesce, but to welcome them, don't they? Well, yes. I guess it, uh, it, uh, it kind of goes back to the point that Orwell made in his 1984. Um, it wasn't enough to submit to Big Brother, but had to love Big Brother. And uh, we see that going on all around us today, where um, people are embracing what is being held out as uh, solutions to problems. And in the process of embracing this, um, slowly but surely, uh, they are transformed, or the world is transformed, and, and on, on a scale that is heretofore unimaginable. One of the new buzzwords of the New World Order architects now is sea changes. Uh, they've just, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations has just authorized a book um, utilizing sea changes, uh, transformation of America. Um, and uh, a sea change, given their interpretation, is a change of such magnitude and such scope as to change the face of the earth. If a, if a sea changes its location, that's a big deal, right? So that's what we're talking about here. But yes, you're right in that sense, Chip. But Orwell spotted it in 1984. But why well. is that? Why, what, what is there about today's would-be world planners? They don't merely want the power, they want the applause. Well, yes, I think that that's true. And, and uh, I, I want to come back to this a little bit later when I talk about the role of knowledge uh, and knowledge in, the, in, the, in its broadest sense, everything from the media uh, to preschool and day schools. Uh, to uh, shape the mind um, so that it is embraced. I mean, if the whole world were rebelling, uh, the New World Order wouldn't stand a chance of succeeding. Uh, if everybody was up in arms against it, uh, there aren't enough people to turn into cops, okay? Uh, so ultimately, um, acquiescence and embracing, free embracing of these ideas is what's sought after. And, and that has, that has been the, the contemporary uh, drive. Uh, and remember, these arguments, as it relates to man versus the state, uh, Herbert Spencer wrote about it uh, in his book by that title, or Albert uh, Nock uh, in uh, Our Enemy, the State, uh, Alfred J. Nock. Uh, but that's just contemporary expressions. I mean, that was the discussion of Plato in the Republic, uh, the, the Platonian versus the Aristotelian schools of thought. That was the argument between Jefferson and Hamilton. From whence does the power come and where is the repository of natural rights? Uh, so if people are going to uh, be acquiescent to the new world order, they have to embrace it and welcome it. Well, today they're not ready to embrace the new world order, but they are certainly embracing parts of the bait leading to the new world order. And, and just in case we haven't stepped on enough toes so far, let's, let's talk about a few of the things, a few of the noble causes that will lead free Americans cheerfully to embrace their plans. And uh, certainly the most significant, you've said it time and time again, the biggest change in power in our world today is occurring uh, not in the deserts of Arabia, but in the environmental movement. Indeed it is, um, because in the, under the name and under the banner of environmentalism, you not only see uh, the transfer of control of virtually all of the world's natural resources, but it 
ultimately gets down to control of people too. If you take the environmental movement as it is being played out today uh, through the major centers of influence, uh, the, the foundation network, organizations like the Nature Conservancy and the World Wildlife Federation and the World Wildlife Congress and uh, Earth Watch and all the rest of them, you'll see that sooner or later, if you boil all the arguments down, it gets, it, it gets down to controlling two things, natural resources and people. And there isn't anything other that than that. pretty Jim. much covers that's the earth. The, yeah, that's the whole thing. And it, it is being done in, in a way that is, uh, it's almost tidal wave in its uh, sea, sea change, if you will, uh, in its application. Um, everything from little kitty cartoon shows on Saturday morning, like Captain Planet, who's out there smiting the greedy capitalists because of acid rain and the vision of acid rain uh, in the child's mind is, uh, you know, uh, battery acid uh, dropping on their heads um, to, uh, to such things as uh, the Clean Air Act that cuts across all areas and, in, and empowers government to act in ways and to such dimension as to be uh, heretofore unimaginable. Um, now, being from the Pacific Northwest and growing up uh, adjacent to the Olympic National Forest and living on the Puget Sound, nobody from my part of the world could be anything but a natural conservationist. I mean, you walk along the beach and you just automatically pick up uh, uh, flotsam and jetsam and refuse. But what's being done in the name of environmentalism today under specious and heretofore totally unproven hypothesis, global warming, uh, ozone depletion, uh, acid rain, uh, population uh, explosions, None of these areas, and this is not the time to, to debunk them all, uh, but none of these areas stand the scrutiny of any sort of penetrating scientific thought. Um, and, but, but when you see the whole, the whole litany of laws and rules and regulations, these are having dramatic effects on people's lives. Another area uh, that, are, that is having dramatic effects on people's lives is being done in the name of stopping the scourge of drugs. Now, I don't think uh, any of us uh, certainly are for uh, advocating a, 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 a drug-filled society, but if you want to examine just how far incursions on your privacy have gone in the name of stopping drugs, you go down to your local bank and try to draw out $10,000 in cash and then find out how many forms and applications you have to fill out to take out your own money out of the bank. Uh, because if you start moving that much cash around, you are suspect. Um, and in the environmental world, the same thing is going on. Every businessman is guilty until proven innocent in the mind of the power seekers pushing the environmental movement. Well, in, in both cases, and let's explore them for a few moments, uh, environment and, and drugs, uh, Number one on the environment, do we have problems? Well, of course, there's always problems. I mean, it, people move into uh, new areas, and there are always problems. All of these movements, the environmental movement, the control of the land, the control of resources, the control of the people, uh, we don't have time today to go into all of the rights and wrongs. And, and I know you have a new book coming out on the environmental movement called The Greening. Uh, but let me ask you a bottom line question for this conversation. What has all of this got to do with the New World Order? It has everything to do with the New World Order because it was the architects of the New World Order who embraced environmentalism as a solution to many of the problems that they saw for people control and natural resources control. As I point out in my forthcoming book, The Greening, uh, there was a study done uh, under uh, the auspices of the then Kennedy administration um, to examine what would happen when war uh, was no longer a, a proper mechanism uh, for expanding the role of the state. Um, this study group called by the Kennedy administration into existence later became known as the uh, Iron Mountain Study Group. And one of their number uh, wrote a, uh, quite anonymously uh, something called the Report from Iron Mountain. Now, when, was, when was this again? 1963 was when the group came into existence, and the Report from Iron Mountain was published four years later in 1967. And there in Report from Iron Mountain, 
and I can't quote from it directly, but the argument was made that in a generation or a generation and a half from now, environmentalism will be a able to be used as a substitute for uh, the armaments industry or the waste of war, uh, which they refer to as an as a absolute necessity, uh, the purposeful wasting of 10% of the gross national product in order to keep the generation of dollars in the uh, in the industrial system, but do it now, 20, uh, you, speaking at that time, it was use war, or the threat of war, Cold War, um, but 20 odd years from now, environmentalism will serve that role. Then, um, 20 years ago, uh, on the very same month that the first Earth Day was, uh, was celebrated, uh, one of the wise men, one of the six friends and the world he made, uh, George Kennan, writing in Foreign Affairs, the quarterly of the Council on Foreign Relations, wrote a lengthy article on environmentalism as a, an important part in restructuring the world in preparation for the New World Order. So, yes, the, the very same people. In fact, it's not without interest that when you start taking a look at the environmental groups, the major ones, there are two members of the Council on Foreign Relations. The World Population Council is uh, chaired by McGeorge Bundy, the man who, whom uh, it was uh, guessed probably was the one who called for the report from Iron Mountain Report anyway, which was later, I should say, acknowledged to be the handiwork of John Kenneth Galbraith, who was a mainstay of the Kennedy administration. Professor Galbraith later, ad later admitted his authorship of that work. Well, McGeorge Bundy's head of the Population Council. Uh, John Sawhill, uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, energy czar, is now the president of the Nature Conservancy, which last year, its budget, uh, they raised $164 million, all in the name of uh, environmentalism. So if you start taking a look at the environmental groups, uh, you, f you find some interesting people popping up. For example, let me give you one more. Uh, one of the groups uh, that has played a very prominent role in building the new Europe uh, is called the Bilderberger Group, which was uh, held at the Bilderberg Hotel in Oosterbrook uh, in 1954. The figurehead leader of the Bilderberger Conference was then Prince Barnhard of the Netherlands, who 10 years after that in 1964 was the first head of the World Wildlife Congress. Uh, so the very same people are popping up. Uh, in 1987, uh, there was a huge meeting held in Denver uh, the World Environmental Congress. And there you had uh, Mr. Rothschild, uh, Edmond de Rothschild of the Rothschild Banking Dynasty, Mr. David Rockefeller, uh, then uh, Secretary of the Treasury Jim Baker, all talking about what the world has to do now in the name of environmentalism. So if you track insiders as I've been doing low these many years, and you start seeing these timbers being brought from this direction and the support mechanisms being brought from this direction, and then you start to see and examine all of these things fit very neatly into the control of natural resources and populations in the New World Order scheme of things. I was going to say that for, for those people who believe strictly in the accident theory of history, there sure are a lot of accidents. Well, in that's right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, these, uh, if we're supposed to be that naive, and we are, uh, then we would ignore this. Um, but we do so at our own peril and ultimately at our, uh, at our own um, liability. Because um, the idea of exercising power chip is really, if you study history, that's what history is about. The attempts of one man or a group of people to exert their, their vision, their view of how things should be run over others. Uh, and in today's contemporary society, it is no different. Um, but uh, in this particular instance, it, it's even, I think, far more debilitating than Tamerlane or Genghis Khan, because ultimately it, it rots the soul. It rots the soul. In the final part of their discussion, Larry responded to Chip's question about what he thought were the chances of success for the New World Order and what we might look forward to in the future. Are they going to succeed? Will the New World Order be built? No. Um, much of it will be built. Um, but I don't think it will be because 
ultimately it starts to fly in the face of the nature of man. And, uh, and if we are to learn again the lessons of history, we will find that anything that flies in the face of the nature of man ultimately uh, comes unstuck. Um, I might add that the New World Order is quite pragmatic in its application, and its architects are quite pragmatic. They thought that socialism, initially, would be the system whereby they would be able to establish a New World Order, only to find out that socialism was far too uh, constricting, and that fascism was a far better mechanism. Thus you see the whole restructuring going on in the Soviet Union and other socialist countries today. And those are socialist countries, not communist countries. Um, and so they're ready to make these moves because one of the things that most people don't understand is that uh, they, they pour copious amounts of money into behavioral scientific studies. Uh, the whole idea of popular opinion polls. How is this playing in Peoria and uh, behavioral sciences and sociology? All of that is a contemporary examination of how is it playing out. Is Big Brother being loved? Or is Big Brother being hated? And if so, what are the changes that have to be made? Again, because they want us to applaud them. We yes, want us to love them. Yes. And, uh, and that's not unusual. Um, there are two things that go with power. Um, and if you study the lives of powerful people, uh, regardless of whether it was Pharaoh or Caesar uh, or Hitler um, or pre contemporary presidents, um, the greater the power, the greater the paranoia. Power and paranoia seem to grow up the scale together. And the greater need to feel loved as they exercise the power. And uh, this, is, uh, this is an interesting phenomena uh, and one that, uh, that I'm sure behavioral scientists will be wrestling with for years. Um, but right along with it, um, there are other natural phenomena that take place too. As crises grows in a society and uncertainty grows, and people are, are uh, more fearful of the future because it represents a, a, a cloudy, misty, uh, distant, uh, and not comprehensible condition, that sort of crises also creates um, a polarization of human activity. Um, the Russian emigre sociologist Sorokin, who headed the first department of sociology at Harvard, referred to it in a book called Man and Society in Calamity. And there he pointed out that the greater the crises, the greater the polarization of human activity, saints and sinners. Uh, the, and we see that all around us today, too. And I might add that uh, when you start talking about uh, the, the polarization, the middle giving way, um, the, the phenomena, as we talked about earlier, of fundamentalism, whether it's Islamic fundamentalism or Christian fundamentalism or Jewish fundamentalism, any fundamentalism that grows up is very altruistic in its approach. But it has the other side of the same coin is the hedonism, uh, the rampant uh, sensuality. Uh, and this has been discussed by other historians and behavioral scientists as well. But part and parcel of this pathology of human action, if you will, is the absolute desire to have people willingly go into and embrace mm -hmm. the new world order. And that sets the stage for uh, the third mechanism of control, what Toffler called knowledge. And now knowledge is an all-encompassing thing. Um, we tend to think of it too often in its formal setting, the classroom, but its informal setting is far more uh, penetrating, far more effective, and, uh, and far more mind-shaping than the, just the years we spend in a formal setting in a classroom. Well, let's talk about knowledge for a while. Talk about two or three levels of knowledge. Uh, and, and let's begin with the obvious one, and that is what the public at large is permitted to know or believe. Uh, you've said repeatedly that all of the facts you've cited, all of the names you've uh, listed just in our conversation today, are all a matter of public record, easily documented, and yet not one American in a hundred, perhaps a thousand, knows about all of this. How has this knowledge been so effectively withheld? 
through control of made two major institutions, uh, major media and major educational institutions. Um, and let's take time to discuss both, Chip, because I think that they are really seminal to any discussion of this type. Today, uh, major media um, is so uh, controlled by people who share this New World Order worldview, uh, ABC, NBC, CBS. The latest convert, CNN. CNN, um, uh, Time magazine, and Newsweek, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times. If you start taking a look at the leadership uh, the chairman or the chief executive officers of every one of those organizations, you'll find their names in the roster of the Council on Foreign Relation membership, without any exceptions. Um, and uh, does that mean that they're all bad men? No, it does not. Because as I've point, pointed out elsewhere, we may not be talking about people who, who view themselves as bad, but they're bad wizards. You know, it's yeah. like <laughs> out of the Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz when she said to him, you're a bad man, and he said, no, my dear, I'm just a bad wizard. But when they control things that, that have of such magnitude as the institutions I just named, including the major book publishing houses like Simon & Schuster and Bantam Books and the others, then you see what, uh, what control they exert over the conduits of knowledge. And today, 95% of the people in this country get their primary information sitting in front of that boob tube four hours a night. And uh, it goes without saying, of course, uh, that the instrument of the state, uh, PBS, and uh, is pushing it on all fronts. Uh, we don't expect something that's run and controlled and administered by the state to actually help dismantle the state. But um, when you start taking a look at the media, there isn't a person in this country today uh, who can look at the media and honestly say we're getting the straight story. Everybody knows they're not getting the straight story. What they don't know is just how pervasive that uh, misrepresentation really is. So they can lie to us by what they say, and they can lie to us by what they keep from us. But Larry, how, how do they keep their own reporters and their own investigators and their own book writers, how do they keep them from getting on the trail of, of this truth? Well, for one thing, it's, it's kind of as simple as monkey see, monkey do, Chip. Um, every profession has a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Uh, people who are considered at the top of their game, as it were. And, uh, and those are the people that are emulated. Um, among economists, for example, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith is considered to be at the top of his game. Uh, in statecraft, uh, Kissinger, uh, Brzezinski are at the top of their game, and they're emulated. And people like to emulate those whom they believe are the best and the brightest within their particular discipline. Business is no different. Uh, as a businessman and having been a chairman of a public company and belonged to various business associations, businessmen can be the biggest sheep in the world. And they hear one guy talking about one thing, they start talking about it and they start emulating it and they, they start using the buzzwords. And, and the advertising business uh, is classic. Vance Packard wrote uh, a couple of uh, very interesting books on it. Uh, so uh, what happens is that uh, th the line, as it were, is set down by these uh, gray eminence, uh, where they're the ones who establish a particular buzzword or a phraseology. We talked about sea change earlier. That's a classic example. Uh, detente was another one, uh, actually coined by Henry Kissinger and then picked up by every professor who wanted to feel as though, uh, and he wanted his to convey the idea that he was on the cutting edge, the cusp of uh, foreign policy discussions. So. I remember speaking on college campuses years ago on this subject. Uh, professors would stand up and, and sneeringly say, well, Mr. Abraham, uh, as a liberal professor, I didn't receive my sealed orders in the mail this morning, as in a very mocking way. But what he didn't realize is that he was perpetuating a, a mind thought, a world view, simply by repeating those to whom he looked up. Uh, and, uh, and they, of course, uh, have been created in large part. I mean, uh, um, instant experts. We see it all the time. Uh, and uh, this is how uh, this transfer, uh, transformation takes place. Uh, again, uh, citing um, 
those who, who saw it and, and cut through it and, and wanted no part of it. Orwell, for example, we've mentioned George Orwell. Orwell was a lifelong socialist who finally saw this and then spent the last part of his life uh, cutting through it, uh, trying to hold it up uh, to the derision it deserved. M Malcolm Muggeridge, who grew up in a socialist family and was a journalist of great reputation, same thing. And in, in areas of uh, theology uh, and literature, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, H.L. Uh, Mencken, uh, the list is endless of people who've seen through it and then set out to kind of debunk it or even to expose it uh, much to their great chagrin. I can say in the area of history, for example, um, a man who was held up uh, as a paragon of all historical knowledge, uh, Professor Beard, uh, president of the American Historical Association and um, the economic consequences of the American Revolution, pointing out that the revolutionaries were, were really just kind of uh, protecting their own. Well, when Beard started to get on to the role that the Roosevelt administration played in dragging us into World War II uh, and how the Japanese were purposefully provoked, he was drummed out of the Corps. Yeah. Uh, same way with uh, Professor Harry Elmer Barnes. When he saw the role that war was playing, particularly in World War I and World War II, uh, and wrote his book, uh, Perpetual War for Perpetual Peace, he was driven out of the Corps. Well, rising young stars in the, in the historical discipline say, well, gee, if that can happen to Professor Beard, and if that can happen uh, to Barnes, um, certainly I, that's a line I don't want to pick up. There are career-making stories. Exactly. And there Cor are career-breaking exact, ones. Cor uh, exactly right. And when you start seeing who gets a Pulitzer Prize um, for uh, perpetuating a myth or a lie, um, the Nobel Prize is one of the classic examples. Talk about a public relations farce. The Nobel family made their fortune uh, with dynamite and, and war and then created this great big prize to gloss over a public image. But uh, with very, very few exceptions down through the years, you find that most of the recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize um, have, have been perpetuators of, the, of this worldview. One world government, uh, socialism, things of that nature. The rule of the elite. The rule of the elite. So you're not worried about, uh, not worried, you don't expect Time Magazine to have a front page story on the powers of the CFR, this secretive organization. No. Uh, I've, I've often thought, of, what if a group of private businessmen had a, had a group, 2,000, 2,400 of their most powerful members, meet in secret, allow some reporters in on, the, on their sworn agreement never to reveal what they heard or was discussed to plan how they would transform the world. Well, it should be a front page <laughs> story. You'd think it would be a front page story, but it, somehow it escapes it. It's only been recently that the CFR has even acknowledged its role in these things. It's only been recently that people like Mr. Highland, William Highland, editor of Foreign Affairs, appears as one of the experts in residence for NBC. Um, and, uh, and other CFR spokesmen. Um, but it, people have been writing about it uh, for years, but if you, if you were waiting for front page headlines in the New York Times or the LA Times or the Washington Post, uh, New World Order plot uncovered, uh, it won't happen. Keep waiting. Yes. Well, we've, we've talked about how they've disseminated the messages down through their ranks and also how they keep a lot from the American public. Now let's talk for a moment about the knowledge that's being transferred to the next generation through the education system. How much influence they have there, how they direct it, what they keep from it. Yes. In my opinion, that is the most pervasive element of all because people who have no historical memory uh, do not know the difference between what worked in the past and what didn't. Uh, Santiana is accorded the axiom that those who will learn nothing from the lessons of history are condemned to repeat it. And that certainly is true. And when you start taking a look uh, at uh, what's happening to the state of education in this country, it is appalling. And all you have to do to prove that to yourself is just go back, go to the library, and get a, uh, a McGuffey's eighth uh, reader and, uh, and read it in light of what uh, the average high school senior is reading today. Um, the, even the proponents of the current system acknowledge that upwards to 40% of the graduating seniors are by 1960 standards functionally illiterate. So in the dumbing down process, we see something that, in, that uh, 
that erases uh, an institutional memory. Um, and every year, you know, every year when the school budgets come up uh, for uh, uh, vote, uh, the professional educators, primarily the National Education Association and the, and the various state uh, teachers unions, come out with a whole litany of excuses why each year is worse than the previous year and that the problem will be solved by throwing more money at it, giving them more control. Well, fortunately, and there's what I see as one of the major lights in the tunnel here, is that parents are saying, no, we don't believe that anymore. Uh, as one former educator put it, never have so many spent so much for so little in all the annals of human history. And so parents today are taking a double burden. They are not only paying for the taxation uh, to support the public system, but they are putting their kids uh, in ever-increasing numbers in private schools and home schooling. And uh, naturally, the state fights back uh, by trying to uh, lay down a whole litany of rules and regulations that would eliminate the homeschoolers or eliminate the, the private schools. But it, that isn't happening. But if you want to see what it's done to an institutional memory, just compare today's graduating college senior of 20 years ago, or even better, take a graduating high school senior of 20 years ago. I can say in my own instance, Chip, people often ask me, how did you come on to this? Um, it was in the early 60s, and I was coming out of college uh, and uh, considered myself an intellectual. And I knew that I was an intellectual because I agreed with my college professors who kept reminding me that they were intellectuals. Therefore, I had to be one. Um, but a friend of mine was discussing these things and holding study groups at his home. And I actually set out, uh, in collaboration with a local newspaper, uh, to investigate this and was going to write an expose. Uh, but in order to do it, I had to read all the material. And what I found after 18 months of investigation on my part, such gaping holes in my own formal education that uh, here I am some 25 years later still finding out about those holes. Now you, you learned that you had been deceived. That yes, more by the process of omission than by the process of commission. And what was your reaction to that? I, at first, uh, I thought, well, this is just one area of uh, history and, and uh, contemporary history. And then I became captivated with finding out, well, if I was deceived in this area, what about other areas? And I started digging, digging, di digging. Uh, and I must say, it has been a life's work. Um, you normally, you would go through the normal emotional reactions, uh, indignation, uh, curiosity. Um, uh, thank God the curiosity has never left. Yeah, I remember my reaction was anger. Yes. Anger. But a lot of people today, uh, I think, are afraid of the truth. And let's talk about knowledge for, for a moment and uh, your efforts to disseminate it and what the recipient should do, will do, can do with it. Uh, we've heard a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Earlier, you said uh, knowledge is power. Uh, the Bible promises you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But the truth today will make you what? Well, it, it should spur you to, to uh, evaluate uh, or maybe reevaluate um, one's own worldview and, and what they're doing about it. What, what constitutes a proper role of a citizen? Um, first of all, I've had many people who've uh, read uh, my books and my colleagues' books and articles and come and say, this is such a great problem, so it's so immense, nothing can be done. Well, they're thinking in terms of 51% of the population waking up a week from Tuesday. First of all, that's not how things work. That's certainly not how the New World Order has been implemented over a long period of time. We're, we're dealing here, Chip, with a very, very, very small number of people who have uh, accepted a worldview and are working toward it. Um, the principle of the disciplined minority uh, is an old and time-honored one when it comes to reshaping public opinion. Uh, you don't need mass movements. Mass movements never accomplish anything, mm -hmm. at least nothing lasting. So uh, what people need to do is, first of all, do their homework. And one of the things that I think has slowed down uh, and dramatically hurt um, discussion of this sort many, over the many years 
has been such spurious information out there as to blame it all on the Jews, that it was a Jewish plot, or that it was a Vatican plot, or uh, some other plot. I mean, if a person wants to start getting into cultural discussion, you could call it a white Anglo-Saxon plot far easier than you could a Jewish plot. But that was the problem, is that much of uh, ethnic and cultural and racial hatred has been disseminated in the name of uncovering conspiracies. Uh, and my library is full of that sort of nonsense. And uh, so that slowed it down, but people cannot stop. They have to do their homework because if they don't, they can be easily run into a blind alley and, and, uh, and nothing that generates hatred along racial, religious, or cultural lines uh, will do anything except help make the problem worse, not better. So people have to uh, do their homework. Now, having done their homework, or started doing their homework, how do they benefit? Well, they benefit in a lot of ways. Number one, they can benefit as it relates to their own uh, lifestyle, their own family, their own income. That was one of the things that led us to start Insider Report, was that in tracking uh, the insiders, uh, the wise men, we could see that in time after time after time, they would move in and, and enrich themselves, uh, at <laughs> greatly, I might add. And so Insider Report does exactly that, and I don't mean to turn this into a commercial for the newsletter, but I've never seen a proper uh, fighter for freedom ever queued up to take a government handout. And the more people become dependent on government in times of crises or in hard times, the less they will be able to rely on themselves and their family uh, and the more dependent they will become. It's a vicious circle. So I think that uh, understanding how these things play out in the marketplace are extremely important. How they play out in, um, uh, in the areas of education, as we talked about earlier. These are the things that uh, are very life-changing, life-enriching, and then it, it proposes for each and every one of us a very serious responsibility. One wag said, uh, the horrible thing about the search for truth is that you will probably find it. And once you do, then there's a responsibility shift that takes place. What do you do about it? Are you your brother's keeper? Remember, it was Cain who asked that. Yeah. Uh, and and, and in, the broad, in, in, in the broadest, most humane sense of the word, yes, we are. Because while we have busied ourselves with our individual lives and our individual pursuits, a great deal of human agony has been played out. Uh, the 20th century is the bloodiest century in all human history. It's being played out as we, as we cut this uh, discussion on, on videotape. So yes, there are responsibilities, and people just can't say, well, that's interesting, or I'll accept part of it. Well, he's off. I don't agree with that 5% of what he said, or 2%. If, if a person agrees in part, in general, then they, the, the onus shifts. Uh, it shifts to them. Do you feel better knowing, understanding what you think is going to take place? Yes, I do. I guess because I've always been one of those types of persons who wanted to know. Uh, I've always wanted to know. Um, because I've had people tell me that if they believed all of this, they couldn't sleep at night. I sleep better than they do. I, I'm sure I do. Um, because knowing is part of the power, but not the power to impose on other people, but the power of confidence that comes within. It really, the things that shape our lives, the things that cause us fear and, dis and, dis and, dis and disconcerts our own thinking, is the fear of the unknown. I don't look out on this with great fear and loathing. I really don't. Because I think I understand what the game plan is. And I think I know what I have to do to protect my loved ones and my family. I would rather have it that way than uh, wake up every day and wonder what did they do to me while I was asleep and why did they do it and how are they doing it. Uh, knowledge is power, but the knowledge that comes within ourselves, the security that comes within ourselves, that's key. That's key. I think the insiders themselves understand that. And certainly they do. And I should make something else very clear too. It's easy to uh, want to... Uh, uh, cast all of these people who are pursuing their dream, the New World Order dream, as evil people. Well, there are evil people in the world, and, and that's part of reality. There are people who consciously choose evil. And one of the great uh, observers of the 20th century, C.S. Lewis, in that uh, last book in his trilogy, uh, wrote a book called That Hideous Strength, where he talked about the conscious choosing of evil. 
But most of these people are what another great observer of contemporary times called equivocal men. Um, they think that they are doing the best for mankind. They think they're cutting the best deal that they can. They think that they are doing the greatest good for the greatest number, but you boil it all down, uh, it's because they in large part believe that they will be part of that ruling establishment, that elite, and uh, won't necessarily have to live by the same rules, as I found it when I was in Moscow. Two t entirely different social structures. One for the 97% of the people who live out there in the, in the cold, and the other for that 3% who ran the country. I was going to interject, even if they're not real sure that what they're doing is for the betterment of mankind, they know it's for the betterment of themselves. Indeed they do, and, uh, and uh, Emerson once said that every mind must make its choice between truth and repose, but there's an awful lot of action that takes place uh, in the name of justifying one's action. The mind can rationalize some terrible things, and Stalin certainly epitomized that when he said one death is a tragedy. Millions of deaths are simply statistics. So while they may not view themselves as evil, and they may be nice people to sit down and, and, and uh, break bread with and even enjoy uh, dinner, um, they have made choices that are wrong choices, and many, many people have had to give their lives, uh, their fortunes, and their sacred honor because of those bad choices. Are they going to succeed this time? Will you and I see a new world order established? I think in large part we will, but you asked me earlier, do I think the new world order will succeed? And I said no, uh, because it does fly in the face of human nature. But I do think that uh, it's far enough along now, the momentum is far enough along now, and I keep waiting for it to become part of that congressional debate. Uh, once that happens, then things could change very quickly. God will not be mocked, Chip. In the end, uh, in the end, uh, God the, will not be the mocked. The Tower of Babel will not The Tower to, of Babel will, will crumble. Um, but it's the human misery and the, uh, and the agony uh, that goes on in the process. And finally, as, as you see this unfolding, as you see crises being contrived, as you see wars being arranged, as you see walls, some come tumbling down and new ones being built, what are you going to do? I'm going to keep on finding out. I don't know any other way. I think I have been given a, a particular stewardship, uh, and that is to uh, go where some people don't want to go in these, in these hunts, in these academic pursuits, and then share that information to the best of my ability. And I long ago gave up the, the concern of whether or not I was going to be a popular at the, in a cocktail party inside Washington, D.C., or inside the Beltway. Um, now, I, I'm going to continue doing what I have been doing. I'm going to continue to study, I'm going to continue to write, I'm going to continue to speak out, because I, I have enjoyed, and I'm sorry that my, my partner and colleague Gary Allen isn't alive to see it today, because so much of what we wrote 20 years ago have been justified. We, we kind of have been justified, and, the, and, I'm, and I would be less than human if I told you there isn't some satisfaction in that. But um, I, I guess I'll just keep on doing what I've been doing. I don't, I don't think there's anything else for me to do. And, and in fact, I kind of feel like a pro athlete in this regard. Um, I make a nice living doing precisely what I want to do. And if someone won't listen, won't learn, won't follow, won't read, just prefers to ignore everything you want to tell them, what do you do? I don't do anything because far greater teachers than Larry Abraham uh, have been ignored and, um, and will be. Um, the greatest teacher of all, Rabbi, our Lord, um, certainly wasn't what you'd call a popular figure. Um, and other great teachers, Socrates drank the ham hemlock, uh, and others, Galileo, and, and Thomas Aquinas was called a dumb ox, and, down, and on and on you go. So uh, I, I guess I don't expect to be uh, a popular person. Uh, win a popularity contest, but uh, I never set out to in the first place, and I don't think anybody who travels this road really expects to. But you won't stop? I won't stop.
For more information, contact Soundview Publications, P.O. Box 84903, Phoenix, Arizona, 85071. If you would like to receive a free copy of Larry Abraham's most recent Insider Report newsletter, please call toll-free 1-800-528-0559.